When we examine the world around us, what do we see? Do we appreciate the complexity of the creation, the complexity of nature? Do we consider the uniqueness of our planet, the only planet that we have found that can support life? Or do we focus on the construction and the technology of mankind and the amazing accomplishments that man has done? Do we take all of this for granted and just go about our daily lives and don't really think about it one way or the other? This evening we're going to be considering the one-of-a-kind planet that we live on and the creatures that have been created to inhabit it. The creation around us with all of its beauty, it is a sign to us of the existence of God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. where Paul speaks about the witness of creation to the existence of God. Paul is speaking in Romans chapter one of those that were unrighteous, that denied the existence of God, and I'll read from the ESV. We're gonna start at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now, Paul here is speaking more specifically about the foolishness of idolatry how people throughout history have, as he says, exchanged the glory of the immortal God, something that they can't see, into something that they can see, like an idol in the shape of a man or an animal, birds and creeping things. And that way of thinking has continued throughout history to our time, where most of humanity ignores and denies the existence of God, and instead they focus just on the things they can see, and they believe that everything that we see around us has come about as the result of slow evolutionary change and life forms gradually increasing in complexity and diversifying into different kinds and species that we see today. Well, a Christadelphian writer and speaker, Brother Bob Lloyd, when speaking to someone who believed in the theory of evolution would say, I admire your faith because they believe that everything we see around us came from nothing by random, by complete chance, and just happened to turn out absolutely perfect. And it's not our purpose tonight to go into an in-depth analysis of creation versus evolution, but we can see how, as Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. You will often hear scientists talk about Earth as an Eden, as if that's just an abstract term for a beautiful place. And they don't give any honor to God as the creator of that paradise garden in the beginning. Scientists speak of systems in creation as plants and animals having a code or being designed for specific purposes, but then they attribute that design to random chance guided by nature as if nature was consciously making choices and decisions. They can see that there is intelligent design. They can see God's eternal power and divine nature in the things that have been made, but they do not honor him, as Paul says in Romans 1. And the result of that way of thinking leads to ridiculous ideas about our world. You might recognize this man, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and SpaceX, When considering the world around us in an interview, he compared the world around us to video games. 
because video games are designed and built by intelligent beings and characters inside those games have rules and laws and limits that they are bound by. And games are becoming more realistic all the time. If you look at the improvement that has happened, it is undeniable. And so he says, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, games will eventually be indistinguishable from reality. And then he therefore concluded, we are most likely in a simulation. That was his conclusion. But it's not just the theory of eccentric billionaires. This man is named Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's become sort of a celebrity astrophysicist, very well respected. He agrees with that theory, giving it, quote, better than 50-50 odds that the simulation hypothesis is correct. And when asked about it, he said, I wish I could summon a strong argument against it, but I can find none. These are the leading minds of our day. They can see there is order. They don't deny that. There is designs and patterns in creation, but their conclusion is not of a divine creator. Their conclusion is that we must be living in some virtual reality, like a video game, that another life form is controlling. As Paul said, they can see intelligent design, they can see God, but they do not honor him. We believe that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he created a wonderful variety of living plants and animals that have incredible complexity and interdependencies upon one another. Ecosystems ranging from dry, sandy deserts to lush, tropical rainforests, from barren, frozen tundra to vast, deep oceans. And everything is interconnected. The polar ice caps reflect light and energy from the sun to help cool our planet. Sand from the Sahara Desert in Africa is blown across the Atlantic Ocean to deliver nutrients in the Amazon rainforest. Microscopic organisms in the ocean called phytoplankton provide half of all the oxygen that we more complex creatures breathe in our atmosphere. This planet that God has created for us to call home is an amazing place. And he has created all kinds of animals that are perfectly suited to the many different environments around the globe. Our reading in Job 39 is in the middle of a section from chapters 38 to 41. So let's, let's turn back there. Back to our reading in Job 39. The book of Job is written as a series of speeches. The central storyline is that Job is going through great trials from God and he and his three friends go back and forth through the different chapters, trying to make sense of it all, with his friends concluding that Job must have done something terribly wrong to deserve the suffering that he is facing. And near the end of the book, from chapters 32 through 37, another individual, Elihu, responds to Job and his friends, saying that Job should not be justifying himself, that he doesn't deserve the suffering, the treatment that he's enduring, and he also rebukes the three friends, saying that they're not in the place of God to be determining why Job is going through the things that he is. And in chapter 38, the Lord himself responds by showing his power and majesty, and he does that by showing the works of creation to illustrate our need to be humble before him. He talks about the earth itself and the great oceans, the mighty storms that come upon the earth. And he talks about the animals that he has created as well in chapter 39. And the more we as humans learn about animals, the more we are amazed and impressed by what we discover. And we're going to consider several examples this evening. And if you haven't read this book yet, all of the uh, members of our ecclesia did receive a copy of that, but it's The Wonders of Creation, The Works of the Divine Designer. Uh, it's by a Christadelphian writer, David Burgess. Uh, it's a great resource with many more examples that you can look at of the 
not only animals, but also the, the planet in general, the plants that we have on Earth. And it's written as a series of articles that were compiled, so it's very easy to just pick it up and read a couple articles at a time without having to, to get too into it. So it's, it's quite a good resource. Now in Job 39, it opens by God speaking of the wild goats. And he focuses on the aspect of them bringing forth offspring. Reading from verses two to four, and I'm going to read from the ESV. It says, can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch, bring forth their offspring and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out and do not return to them. Now in verse three, you might have noticed the ESV seems to skip over the part about casting out their sorrows. But if you look at Rotherham's translation, it includes that, it says their pains they throw off. And this section, although speaking specifically about wild goats, is so applicable to many of the animals, if not all of the animals. Animals' entire lives, whether long or short, are driven by the need to produce offspring. And they go to great lengths to find breeding areas, to give birth, to raise their young. And the birth of an animal is nothing like the birth of a human child. And so when it says about casting off their sorrows, just, in the ESV, just they bring forth and are delivered. That's it. It's fairly simple for animals. And then we read in verse 4 that they grow up, they go forth, and they don't return to them. And that is so true that animals do mature much faster than humans and are able to fend for themselves much quicker than we are. And so the first example that we're going to look at is not of uh, wild goats, but of wildebeest uh, and the circumstances around the birth of their offspring. The Serengeti Plains in East Africa support over a million wildebeest. The herds follow the seasonal rains, grazing on the newly sprouting grass that comes in their wake. Each year, within a three-week period, the females give birth to over a quarter of a million calves. This youngster is just a few days old. Playing strengthens its legs for the long journey that lies ahead. stay close to its mother. Without her milk, it would starve. And the herds are always traveling, following the rains as they drift across the plains in order to find fresh grazing. Eventually, they reach woodlands. So 250,000 calves are born in just a three-week period. And as you can see, just a few days old, they can already run and jump. And that's necessary because they do have to travel, travel great distances as they follow the rains and they continue to eat the grass that grows in their wake. And a major benefit of being able to run at such a young age is that they need to use that ability to avoid predators. But that's part of the interdependency of God's creation because predators also have young ones to feed. And so as he was saying is the wildebeest 
reach the more forested areas of the plains, they reach the territory of African hunting dogs as one example of a predator. And these take advantage of the fact that the wildebeest have so many young and they attempt to catch them as prey because the adult wildebeest are too strong for these dogs to take down, even though they work in packs. So the dogs target the calves. They're much easier, much smaller. But the adults protect the calves by blocking them, keeping them more in the center of the herd and getting between the dogs and the wildebeest calves. Now, not all calves will be so fortunate as to be spared, as to escape the dogs, but then again, not all of the dog pups will survive if they don't have enough to eat as well. And so God has created this balance in these ecosystems between the hunter and the hunted. And in the case of both the predator and prey, they grow up and develop so much quicker and they're out on their own and they don't return to their parents and they lead their own lives. Now, continuing in Job 39, it goes on to talk in verse 5 about the, the wild ass. And it says in verse 6, whose house I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwellings. Now, you might notice if you have a margin with notes in your Bible that where it says barren land, the Hebrew says salt places. And the ESV supports that in verse six, it says, to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling place. And as I was looking for different material to show, examples to show, I was surprised by the importance of salt in the animal kingdom. We think of salt simply as a seasoning that we add to food, but for animals, it is very important. They go to great lengths to consume that as essential part of their diet. In Africa, gorillas and elephants in the Congo jungle journey to these open marshy wetlands called bays in order to gain access to salt, which they can't get in the jungle, so they have to go to these places. Gorillas will eat the plants that grow from the water, which are rich in salt, while animals, or sorry, while elephants, instead they get the salt by stirring up the mud with their long trunks and they drink the water that they are roaming through. And that is how they get those nutrients. And they know just where to go without advanced chemical tests or without advanced equipment. They know exactly where to go to get this salt. Even though it's not in the place where they normally live in the forest, they have to go to these, these wetland clearings instead. In the Amazon, similarly, many different creatures like the black spider monkey make use of salt licks, which are naturally occurring mineral deposits. And these monkeys, they will only come down from their home, normally high in the trees, down to the ground in order to take advantage of these salt licks to get that as part of their nutrition because, again, they depend on that. And they work together because predators also know that these animals depend on that. So when one monkey goes down to the salt lick to get those nutrients, another one will stand guard and look out and will sound an alarm if they notice that a predator is coming to warn the one that can't be looking because he's down on this salt lick. Amazing that they can work together in those ways. One of the most interesting examples uh, is that of flamingos. Uh, there's a salt pan in the country of Botswana in Africa that most of the time is desolate, dry, and hot. But when rain does come, it floods the area and it becomes a flamingo breeding ground. the salt pan. Triggered by some unknown signal, flocks of lesser flamingos arrive from thousands of kilometers away. that the flamingos feed on have lain dormant as spores in the dust. But most importantly, 
the birds are here to breed. Perfect conditions might occur only once in a decade. The birds nest on an island far from the shore. They build mounds of mud that raise up their eggs and so keep them just marginally cooler than they would be at ground level. The water surrounding the island is so salty that predators do not venture into it. So the nests are safe. 30 days later, thousands of chicks start to hatch. I don't know if you caught some of the things that were said there, but from thousands of kilometers away, these flamingos know that once in a decade conditions have occurred, giving them a place to feed on algae that has lain dormant, a place to hatch their chicks that is safe from predators, and they make those mounds so that it keeps the eggs cool, I find that absolutely remarkable. And they say that it's triggered by some unknown signal. And that's because God has created them with that ability. But the water does eventually dry up, and they do have to leave the salt pan and search for fresh water. And the chicks can't fly at that point because the water does dry up fairly quickly, so they're not that old. And they have to walk for days with the adults leading them for 50 kilometers. And amazingly, most of the chicks do survive and they reach fresh water and they survive that journey. Now looking back again to Job chapter 39, skipping down to verse 13. In the King James it says, Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich. The translation does seem odd in the King James, as, the, as most other translations don't talk about peacocks at all. For example, the ESV says the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the pinions and plumage of love? And you might see in the margin of the King James that storks are mentioned as well, uh, as a way of contrast. But the point I want to make here is simply to talk about the complexity, the variety of birds that we have on Earth. We looked just now at the flamingo with its tall skinny legs and bright pink feathers. We have the ostrich that is mentioned. And in verse 18, it talks about the ostrich that she scorneth the horse and his rider. And ostriches can run at speeds of up to 70 kilometers an hour, which is faster than the average racehorse with someone on its back riding it. You have the hawk and the eagle mentioned in verses 26 and 27, which soar high in the heavens and use their keen eyesight to, to find their prey afar off. And it's interesting, it's noteworthy that the Bible speaks specifically of the eagle's eyesight in verse 29, from thence she seeketh the prey and her eyes behold afar off. Because eagles have extremely strong vision. Their eyes are positioned in such a way that they can see almost completely around their head, 340 degrees. They can see prey up to two miles away. And they can also see ultraviolet light, which humans cannot. And while the ostrich and the hawk, the eagle may not have as impressive feathers, the peacock, that is mentioned at least in the King James, is one of those examples of birds that have beautiful plumage that they use to attract one another. But sometimes the design of the feathers is not enough. And in the Amazon and into southern parts of Mexico, there are dozens of species of birds called mannequins. And each of them not only has unique plumage, feathers, but they also have unique and elaborate dance routines that the males use in order to attract females. And we'll look at one example here. The golden collared mannequin starts by clearing his dance floor.
a female arrives and he starts his routine rocketing from one perch to another. She checks out every detail. Finally, he performs his signature move. The back flip. With twist. Perfection. The red-capped mannequin has a very different act. It's a kind of slither. With wing snaps. The most complex routine is that developed by the blue mannequin. The lead male is supported by three junior dancers. They practice together almost every day. During rehearsals, a young male in juvenile plumage stands in for the female. The dance has to be perfectly synchronized. With the lead male happy, they're ready to present their dance to a female. In a carousel of movements, each male takes his turn at the front. The lead male performs the final move. I find that complexity and the variety just astounding and to think that these behaviors and the fact that they work and that the correct female finds the move attractive, that that could just come about by slow change completely randomly, it just defies logic. When something is choreographed to that extent, surely it is the work of a creator. Now there's a few more examples that I want to show. Uh, which are not talked about in Job 39, and one of these is that of insects. We do see the grasshopper mentioned in verse 20, but that's just in comparison to the horse. According to a National Geographic Encyclopedia article on biodiversity, scientists estimate there are 8.7 million species of plants and animals on Earth, but only around 1.2 million species have been identified, and most of those are insects. In fact, despite their small size, insects are so numerous that half of all the biomass of animals on Earth is made up of insects. So you think about that. You take all of the humans, all of the whales and fish, all of the land animals, and how much all of that would weigh, that's about the same as the weight of all of the insects on Earth. And if you just think about how many ants it would take to weigh the same as a human, you can't even really comprehend how many insects there are on earth. If we turn over to Proverbs chapter six, we read something about the ants. Proverbs chapter six, starting in verse six, compares the activity of ants to that of a sluggard. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. 
Colonies of leafcutter ants, as an example, in the Amazon can number in the millions and they work together so well that all of the individual ants have a specific role that they do for the greater good of the whole colony and they work together so well that it's as if the colony were one large creature. They can remove all of a tree's leaves within 24 hours in the Amazon. And when they take the leaves back to their nests, which can be up to eight meters deep, it's not to eat the leaves, but they use the leaves to grow a fungus that they then use to feed to their larvae. And in order to keep the fungus healthy, they also have a certain type of bacteria used to make sure that the fungus doesn't get a disease and die because that's an important food source for them. So when the Proverbs says that they gather her food in the harvest, it really is appropriate to use farming terms when talking about the activity of these ants and what they accomplish. And the fact that they use bacteria the way that we would use pesticides in controlling pests and keeping our crops safe is just extraordinary. There's another species of ant uh, in Europe that are part of an extremely balanced relationship with plants and another insect. And it starts with the Alcon blue butterfly, which lays its eggs on one specific species of plant. The eggs soon hatch into caterpillars. High up on the plants, they're safe from predators below. But then the caterpillars do something seemingly suicidal. They abseil down on threads of silk to the ground below and into danger. They have no defense against the marauding ants which carry them off. But this is exactly what the caterpillars need to happen. Then producing a scent like that emitted by an ant larva. The ants respond by taking them back to their nest. There, they deposit them in the colony's brood chamber. The purple-coloured caterpillars lying among the ants' own white larvae give off just the right signals. And the nurse ants rush to feed them. But there is more. The caterpillars now start to mimic the sounds made by the queen ant. And as a result, the ants treat them like royalty. If food gets short, the ants will even feed the caterpillars instead of their own young. They give them such quantities of food that the caterpillars grow hugely. There, underground, the caterpillars feed and grow for nearly two years until one day there is nothing for the ants to feed. The caterpillars have pupated. But a few weeks later, out crawls an Alcon Blue butterfly. The young adult makes its way out of the nest and clambers up a grass stem. Its wings expand as it prepares to fly off and find a mate. These butterflies depend entirely on one specific species of plant to lay their eggs and on the ants to survive in order to be fed and to grow. 
and God has given them the precise tools in order to do that, to mimic the ant larvae and the ant queen. Having your very existence depend so tightly on two other specific species hardly seems like an evolutionary advantage, but it does show the creative power of God in developing unique and complex life cycles. Now, one of the benefits of having so many insects on Earth is that they are prey for many kinds of animals. Large animals like orangutans eat ants as an important part of their diet. They can catch them in their thick fur and pick them off and eat them, or they can even sometimes use tools to dig them out of a tree. And many small animals will also eat insects, like the next example, which is the velvet worm from Borneo. It detects its insect prey through vibration and touch. But with no turn of speed, how does it capture these fleet-footed critters? The answer is stranger than fiction. Glue guns. The sticky slime hardens on impact, trapping the luckless insect. The velvet worm will inject the cockroach with digestive saliva and then suck out its insides. He said it's stranger than fiction. You can't make that stuff up. And as gross as that is, it's very impressive that something as small and seemingly insignificant as a worm is given such specialized ways of capturing prey. Now, one part that we haven't explored on this subject to this point is the ocean. The ocean covers 70% of our planet, and yet much of it is still unexplored and its secrets undiscovered. And the health and diversity of the oceans is key to the survival of all creation. God has made the earth as the only planet that we have that has liquid water on its surface. And God has filled the oceans with an abundance of life. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, on the fifth day of creation, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth. And the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now the largest living creature on earth that has ever lived is the blue whale. Something that large could only live in the ocean because of the effect of gravity being lessened on its body by the water. And yet they glide so smoothly through all of vast oceans on earth. Typically content to be on their own, they're very solitary. Now, it's hard to comprehend the size of a blue whale, but they weigh 200 tons and are 30 meters long, which is about as long as three school buses. The blue whale's tongue alone can weigh as much as an elephant. When they are born, when they're only a month old, they're already eight meters long and weigh six tons, and they add three tons a month as they grow. They're also the loudest animal on earth. And the Bible simply states that God created great whales. Now, not nearly as large, another marine mammal, dolphins, are much more social, living in large groups with social and family relationships. There's many different kinds of dolphins. One of them, the bottlenose dolphins, has a very special way of capturing their prey. Being as small as they are allows them to venture into shallower waters and in the Everglades in Florida, they can enter these shallow water grasslands where they work together with a very interesting hunting technique. The Everglades are also the hunting grounds of the coast's most ingenious fishermen. Bottlenose dolphins. They search for food using echolocation, a type of sonar. A 
ahead of them, a shoal of mullet. These particular dolphins have developed their own special way of catching their prey. They carefully herd the fish into just the right place. Then one dolphin stirs up a ring of mud that encircles the shoal. The fish panic and take to the air. Most escape. Catching flying fish isn't easy. But the dolphins move on and take another helping. aren't allowed to fish commercially within the National Park. So there's plenty for the dolphins. Only from the air can we really appreciate the industry of these master fishermen. I don't know if that's like feeding time at anyone's house, but God has given these dolphins these abilities to cooperate, to communicate with each other, to delegate roles to each other in such an amazing and remarkable way. Now moving from the shallow coastal waters, our final example is going to be that of another marine hunter in the deep ocean, the bluefin tuna. Bluefin tuna are one of the only fish that are warm-blooded. Their blood vessels are arranged in a very special way so that as they travel through the cold water and they absorb oxygen through their gills, that cools their blood, but then their muscles release heat as they swim, which then warms the blood. And being able to remain warm in cold water gives them a huge advantage when they are hunting in cold water because most cold-blooded animals will be slow and sluggish in cold water. And like dolphins, they also hunt in groups and they coordinate their efforts. These giants cross entire oceans in their search for food. They can grow over three meters long and weigh half a ton. Bluefin tuna. They're streamlined to perfection and built for speed. They hunt in great packs, hundreds strong. The target, a school of anchovies. gently corral the anchovies into a tight ball at the surface. Careful not to cause panic. And then they attack. a high 
highly coordinated hunt. The tuna take turns, striking from the same direction to keep the anchovies on the run. After a mouthful, each bluefin peels off to take its place at the rear. Wave after wave continues the assault. With the power and devastating pace, bluefin tuna are one of the ocean's most impressive hunters. Now again, did you catch some of the terms that they used to describe the, the bluefin tuna? Highly coordinated. They described them as being streamlined to perfection and built for speed. Just like the way that we might describe a car or a boat or a jet, something that takes time and planning to build that requires an intelligent designer. God has created incredible animals in all different sizes, living in vastly different habitats, all in a harmonious cycle of self-sustaining balance. And like Job, we are humbled by God's majesty and his creative power that we can see in the things in nature. We can also learn lessons from the animals and apply spiritual analogies from many of them. There was the lesson of the ants and how that can be an example to us, not to be lazy, but to work hard together as believers in the gospel. And more generally, we also have the spiritual lesson of predator and prey. What can we learn from that? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So in that analogy, we're like the prey, and we need to be watchful that we're not devoured by our predator. But this is not speaking literally. Certainly we don't want to be eaten by lions, but Peter's talking spiritually. Our predator is our sin that is within us. The word devil just means slanderer, and someone that slanders, to slander someone means to tell lies about someone. It goes right back to the Garden of Eden, when the serpent called God a liar, saying that Adam and Eve would not die by eating the fruit. And so we too can give in to sin, pleasing ourselves instead of God, convincing ourselves that it's okay, and in a sense, calling God a liar. That's what we need to be vigilant about. We need to steadfastly resist that, as Peter says as he continues in verse 9 of that chapter. And one day, earth will be made again like Eden, like that beautiful creation in the beginning, when predator and prey will live together in peace, literally and spiritually. Sin will be removed from the earth to afflict humanity no longer. And the wonderful animals of God's creation will live in perfect harmony. And we're just going to close with words from Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 6. Speaking of the time of the kingdom, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.